Hey everyone, welcome back to a special edition of the Dynamic Leaders Podcast. Today, my guest with me is Dr. Paul Semendinger. Paul, thank you so much for joining the show. Hey, Colin, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to this. Absolutely. I'm so happy that we connected and uh, just a little bit of background for folks to understand how we connected in the first place. Paul, uh, in addition to his duties, which he'll outline here in a minute, uh, runs a great blog called Start Spreading the News. It's a New York Yankees blog and my book, Culture of Excellence, obviously coming out last month and him and I connected. He did a really great interview for me on the blog and we've just been talking and uh, I'm not going to ruin exactly what Paul does if I'm on a more regular basis here because I'll let him (laughs) tell the listening audience. But I thought Paul had a really interesting background and we're going to talk about some really interesting topics here in a second. So before I ruin everything, Paul, why don't you take a minute to tell the listening audience a little bit about yourself? So please tell us, who are you? Okay. Thank you very much, Colin. I'm Paul Semendinger. I'm a elementary school principal in Ridgewood, New Jersey. I've been an educator for over 30 years now. It's been a wonderful and terrific career. In addition to that, I'm a dad of three sons. I'm happily married since 1991. So we're coming up on another big anniversary in a couple, and I guess next year, that'll be great. And I'm also, yes, I'm also an author. I've published a number of books, including a wonderful novel called Scattering the Ashes, which I just found out over the last couple of weeks has won a couple of nice prizes and awards and recognition. So I'm very excited about that. And I'm a marathon runner. I play competitive men's baseball, even as a 52 year old guy and softball. And I spend my time as a dad with my family and oh, my kids are all grown now. My wonderful wife and doing my job and uh, just making the most of every single day. I love it. And uh, obviously, we're going to spend a a chunk if the listeners haven't picked up yet. You're an elementary school principal, and I thought this would be a really great opportunity to talk about your leadership and the guidance and expertise and advice that you can provide during this pandemic and, and how you've gone about tackling that. But what I'm interested to just start the conversation before we dive too deep into all that. I mean, you outlined a lot of really different avenues and ways that you live life. Like you're not just a elementary school principal, right? Like there's, there's so much more to you. And I, and I think that a lot of times, you know, no matter what age we are, uh, we can get sort of stuck in that singular identity. Uh, and it seems like, you know, whether it's your family or whether it's fitness, whether it's writing, uh, and then obviously the work that you do in school, uh, there, there's a lot of different things that you have a passion around and, and something that, you know, wakes you up in the morning, I'm sure, and uh, you're just ready to go and, and have a lot of people that you can uh, help along the way. So I'm just wondering, you know, from your perspective, like, how did you come about or how, how did you build a lifestyle where, you know, you, you weren't just an elementary school principal, like you don't just spend uh, 60, 70 hours burning yourself out uh, in the school, you have other likes, you have other passions, how do you did, how did you develop those? And, and how have you been able to maintain those throughout your life? Hey, Colin, that's a great question. I don't know if I have an answer for you. I I think we all make choices and there's a lot of interests I have. There's a lot of things that I wish I could add to this list. I wish I could say I'm a piano player. I I, I try sometimes. Right now, I don't have the time to play piano and to practice. I took lessons for a number of years, so I'm very highly mediocre. But like I say, I think we make choices and um, fitness is a big part of what I do and who I am. I love baseball. I love playing baseball. I love playing uh, men's softball. And I love running. And so you make the choice. Uh, there's a lot of things I don't do. I, I don't go out uh, and party a whole lot. I, I, don't, um, I don't watch a whole lot of TV. And uh, I do read a lot. But, you know, you make the time. If, if something's important to you, you figure out how to get it done. The job as an elementary school principal, especially in these days, is all consuming. But I think you also have to figure out ways that you can Uh, make time for yourself and your family and those people that matter to you so that you don't become burned out. The job is very rewarding. It's it's a great, great, great job. But again, uh, right now it's been 24 seven really since the summer. And I don't think, I think if you don't have some of those other distractions or those other opportunities to enrich your brain in other ways, it can lead to burnout. And I think when you have these other interests, it helps keep you balanced and and keep you on an even plane. Yeah. And I love how you said, make the time to do the things that 
are important to you. And uh, it's not that you're creating time, right? Like we all have the same amount of time every single day, but but you're making a purpose toward the time that you're spending doing this and doing that. And uh, I'm generally just curious about people who are able to juggle a lot of different things. And, and, and I think myself, I, I'm, I'm the type of person that can do that at least semi successfully. Uh, but, but one of the reasons that I specifically wanted to ask you that is because your job is really highlighted at this point, you know, being, being in a leadership position for, uh, there's a, there's an elementary school right down the road from my house and in, in the sign, even before the pandemic, I think like since the moment we moved here has said, uh, learners today, leaders tomorrow. And um, it's something that's always stuck with me, like how important it is for the adults in the room, uh, whether you're a principal like yourself or the teachers, support staff, uh, how important our responsibility is to create leaders in the future and to impact kids, even at such a young age when they're five, six, seven years old. So as far as uh, keeping the, the energy, uh, you know, what, let, let's start there, I think, pretty simply, like, because you've had to take a little bit more of a 24 seven approach due to the pandemic, what are what are some of the like, if you could share like your routine, maybe a little bit, you know, not to the uh, every detail, but you know, how do you go about each day where you're able to Uh, spend the majority of the time in your main responsibility, but also get those other things done? Like, do you have a certain time that you get up? Do you have, you know, certain aspects that you're like, hey, I got to do this every day in order to feel good doing that? Uh, Is there any type of routine that you can share that maybe could help people who are uh, maybe stuck or looking for another way to go about their own work and their own lives? Yeah, that's a great question. I think you, you hit on something right off the bat when you were talking about that school down the street from your house. I think we have to invest our time in what really matters and focus on those things that really matter. And I'm, I'm fortunate that, that I'm a principal and that I get to work in a school. I work with phenomenal teachers. I work in a phenomenal district that's got great leadership. Uh, the parents are extremely supportive. They are phenomenal. But most of all, in addition to that collection of, of great adults, the kids are the, are the reason we go to work every day. And there's a joy and there's a wonder in instructing and building an environment that's conducive to learning for children. And and when you said that children are the future leaders of tomorrow, that's 100% correctly. We're not building the world for ourselves. You know, I'm 52 years old. My my best days, in a sense, are behind me. I'm I'm building these children and helping, helping the teachers build these kids so that they can have wonderful lives. And they have this great potential. And they have the sense of caring and compassion and empathy and love. And they're the ones who are going to make the world an even better place if we give them the tools to do that. And I believe that when you when you step back and you realize that what you're doing really matters and it matters really not for yourself, but for others, that helps to give us the energy to do what we need to do. So with all that being said, long time ago when I was working on my doctorate at Seton Hall, my kids were very little. Uh, one of them was just born. He's now uh, almost 22. And I had to make the decision because that's a grueling process. When was I going to do my schoolwork? When was I going to do all this uh, coursework? And when was I going to write my dissertation? And I think most people write that stuff when they find the time after school and in the evenings and things like that. And I made a critical decision at that point that I did not want to take the time away from my my kids and my wife and all the things that I wanted to do as a dad. When kids are young, they're young only once, and I wanted to maximize those those moments. So I set the alarm for 4 a.m., and I did all my work before I went to work. And, you know, I got that done in, I guess, 22 years ago, in the year 2000, and um, or 20 years ago. And... Ever since then, that's that's sort of been what I do. I wake up at four. I also believe that when we're accessible to people, that they respect our time more. I know there's a thought that you see in 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 schools or in literature that has to do with leadership and stuff, and it says like at four p.m. or at five p.m. turn off your phone and don't be accessible and don't answer emails after a certain time. I answer emails twenty four seven, and um, actually, all the parents of the school have my phone number. 
They don't call me very often, but I've been giving them my phone number for a number of years saying that I always tell you how much I care about this community and how much I care about each of you. And if you ever need me, the best thing to do is email me. But if there's ever an emergency or there's something that you really need to talk to me about, here's my phone number. And, and I, I, again, they respect that and they respect that time and they don't really call me very often, but when they do, I know it's important. And, and I think somehow by making yourself more accessible, you actually buy more time for yourself. I'm not bound to, I have to get everything done by 5 PM. I'm, I'm bound by, I need to just get everything done. So I'll send an email, I'm sure, or two or five during the Yankees game tonight. I'll, I'll do it over the weekend. There might be a text or somewhere along the way. So I'm really working 24-7, except when I'm sleeping, which I don't sleep a whole lot. But I do go to bed early. Most most people go to bed late. I go to bed. If, if I'm reaching 1030 at night, that's that's a late night for me. But <laughs> so so really, I get up at four. I, I first thing I do is I look at my work email. Then I look at my personal email. And then I do work for the blog. I, I have to make sure the blog's all ready to go for that day. So a lot of our articles are pre-published. We write them early or we write them late the night before. Or some of them, like your interview, you gave me that information weeks before it ran. And so I can schedule these things ahead of time. So I look at all the things that need to be ready for the blog that day, get them all lined up to make sure they work, they're, they're ready and scheduled to go. And then I go back to my emails and I make sure everything's ready to go so I then can exercise. Usually it's, I'm running and then I come back in and I check my email and take a shower and get dressed and go to work. And right then I'm there for the kids, I'm there for the teachers and I'm there for the school. And that becomes my focus. I don't do the other stuff when I'm at work. And once work is over, we, we get right back to, you know, trying to do those other things and making time for the other hobbies and, and everything else while always making sure that I'm available to those people who need me. Yeah, I, I, again, I just love the making yourself accessible to other people. I mean, especially in leadership positions, I'm sure that you see this across schools and I don't need you to do any name bashing or anything like that. But uh, in athletics, I see it where there are coaches and there are athletic directors that call themselves coaches and athletic directors, but they are not leaders. And I am sure that there are teachers and there are principals across this country that have the title uh, but are not leaders and do not care enough to go that extra mile. And and that is something that's always been a little bit sad to me. And uh, I don't know that I have the solution to, uh, to fix that and, and to make it so that there's a little bit more urgency when you're in the, these positions. But it's kind of got me thinking, I'd like to segue to a question and use a baseball analogy as a principal you are more, I would say, either like a general manager, executive, maybe even the owner, uh, where you're not necessarily in the trenches all the time. Like you're not in the classroom every single day with like a particular class per se. You're you're overseeing, you know, how many different classrooms within your school, right? Uh, and then your teachers are your on-field managers. You know, your your Joe Torres, your Joe Girardi's, your Aaron Boone's. Uh, and then all the managers throughout the minor league organizations, et cetera. When it comes to you know your philosophy for bringing in a teacher, knowing how important it is because they are in the trenches, they are there with the kids every single day, building that relationship and potentially influencing them to be either great leaders for tomorrow or average people or people that do destructive things in this world. How do you go about your hiring process uh, trying to identify those people who can lead? Like, is there something specific that you are looking for outside of like an education degree from a candidate that says, okay, this person would be a really good fit for my school? You, you're asking great questions. I love this. Yes, absolutely. In my interview process, what I try to do is I try to get to the heart of the candidate. I truly believe that if someone wants to be a teacher and they love kids and they see children as their focus, they're going to do whatever it takes to invest in the, in the, in the profession and invest in the uh, children. And I think that's what makes all the difference in the world. Some people, you know, hire people because of their degree or their expertise in a particular program or approach. 
My concern with that is if I hire somebody because they're an expert in teaching a certain way, and then that certain way goes out of style, it becomes the passe way of teaching as every teaching style eventually goes um, out of style because that's the way teaching is. It just, it's a continually changing. And if, if you marry to one specific approach and that's why you want to teach, once that approach goes away, you've sort of lost your motivation. And now you have somebody on your staff who's an expert on an outdated technology, if you will. But if you have a love of kids and you invest yourself totally and passionately in the idea of being there to instruct kids rather than a subject, rather than an, a, pro, a, a program, you're going to get people that are going to be willing to go the extra mile, to do whatever it takes to help the children. When programs change, they're going to embrace those new programs because they understand that it's not about them, it's about kids. So in my interview process, I try to get to those questions. I ask the question, why do you want to teach? And if they say things like, you know, I'm an expert in this program, or I want my summers off, or I want to be able to leave at 3.30, those are usually bad answers. Uh, I, I want to hear, basically, I want to hear because I love kids. And then I can drill further into that and see if that's just a stock answer that somebody's given them, or if they, right? Or if they really have that, that, in, that enthusiasm and that passion for, for, for being with kids. A, a great question, I'm, I don't think I'm giving anything away here, is sometimes I ask, would I ever see you in the lunchroom while the kids are eating if you didn't have lunch duty? And some people's immediate reaction is, no, 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 that's my lunch period. But other people will be like, yes, I would love to spend some time at lunch with the kids and talking with them and maybe playing with them at recess. And when you hear people who have ideas for wanting to be with kids, then you get the sense that this might be somebody who's, who's worth uh, investing in. And I think 99 times out of 100, when you find someone who loves children, who wants to make a difference in the lives of children, who wants to be a role model and a, and a positive person in children's lives, that person's going to become a great teacher. Absolutely. And I've had a number of teachers on this podcast in the past, and I'm not here to rate them, but I do want to signal out to in particular in the reason that they're coming to mind is because of what you just said about, you know, like if you ask them if they're going to be in the lunchroom with the kids and they say yes or no, that could probably tell you a lot about how invested they are into actually connecting with these kids. That's, that's essentially what we're trying to get to, right? Like, are we connecting? Are we building relationships with these kids? Because if they see us as more than just teachers who teach us the stuff on the blackboards, then we're getting somewhere. And I had a teacher who was my soccer coach, actually, I never had him as a, as a teacher. Uh, but he uh, talked to me on my podcast about how he was having trouble early in his teaching career, connecting with his students, like he connected with his soccer players. And it hit him one day that that time we spent on the bus, for example, going to games or after games and just talking and being regular people was more impactful than anything that he was doing in the school during the day. And so he took it upon himself to a few times a week instead of eating lunch. I mean, literally, like what you just said, instead of eating lunch in the teacher's lounge, going into the cafeteria and sitting down with his students. And he said that made a huge impact on his ability to connect with those students because it's, I think it is arbitrarily harder to make connections in school because your kids are in school, right? Like they're always doing something. Whereas like, you know, if we're an athletic team and we're traveling or something We're we're not always doing something. So that really stood out to me. And another teacher who uh, was on the podcast and really was a powerful impact in my life, um, she did something as simple as asking us to write a letter to her. <laughs> I, and and I, I laugh because I'm sure there's people who are like, what, what, what is that going to do? And she would just ask us to write a letter. I think it was like once every other week. Uh, just uh, just a life update. She was a math teacher. I hated math. Math was my worst subject. She knows that. I know that. But she is the most impactful teacher that I had in high school, in middle school, elementary school, in college, at any level of school, because she actually knew things about me that none of my other teachers knew, because I, I just felt comfortable disclosing some personal information sometime in these letters. And not only would she read them, she would respond back. And so you actually got to have a little pen pal relationship. So, 
you know, I know it's like I talk about in my book all the time. It, this is kind of the culture piece, right? Like, you know, does that always equate to kids getting better grades? Not necessarily. Like I said, I was a terrible math student. That didn't really change my desire to be better in math. But I think like from a, a cultural perspective and, and from an ability to, to really impact these kids, those those things that you mentioned, just being able to walk that extra mile, that is something that really stands out. And, and you know, those because those examples stand out to me. Um, so, you know, it's it's not just you doing lip service <laughs> uh, for your for your interview process, for example, where, you know, you ask them, do you like kids? And then you're trying to just figure out if they gave you the Google answer. You know, you're actually trying to figure out, like, are these people going to go that extra mile? And, and that is vitally important to the success of our school in the long run. Is that accurate? Yeah, that, that's very accurate. Now, not to say that the only way a teacher can be effective is if they go into the lunchroom. I, I have many great teachers that, that don't necessarily eat lunch with the kids. But it, but that's just a question that opens up the, uh, the door and the idea of where their brain is and what, what they're thinking about. I think you made a great point about that teacher who made you write the letter. I would assume that most people listening would have immediately thought that that person was a language arts and English teacher. And then you turned it around, right? You said that person teaches math. And is, isn't that beautiful? Like writing matters, even if you're in math. And that teacher, think about that. How many letters did she get? She read every one of them. She responded in, t- in turn to every one of them and made every single child in her class feel like they were important. And I think that makes all the difference. It doesn't really matter what grade you get, especially in an elementary school. It it matters that you have the passion, the desire, the willingness to work hard and to be the best you that you can be. And we get there most often, I believe, by learning in an environment and working with the teacher that motivates us and makes us feel good about ourselves. And that's what that teacher did. Hey everyone, Christine here from Sweat with Stods, one of this show's sponsors. The Dynamic Leaders Podcast is here to help you be a better leader, and the best leaders take care of themselves both mentally and physically. I'm here to help on the physical side by making fitness accessible to everyone. As a certified personal trainer with years of experience coaching fitness classes, I've designed programs that can be followed at home and in the gym. These are intelligently structured programs, giving you a plan to follow to help you be successful. Build strength with my Get Strong at Home program, get quick results with Hit at Home 1 or 2, or work on your health outside of fitness with my Healthy Habits program. As a listener, you can get these programs at a discounted rate by entering code DYNAMIC at checkout. That's D-Y-N-A-M-I-C at checkout. So head on over to sweatwithstods.com, that's sweat with S-T-O-D-D-S dot com, to take the next step toward achieving your health and fitness goals today. I'm going to transition us to talk a little bit more about the difficulties and the challenges brought on by the coronavirus. And in a leadership position in general these days, there are a lot of uncertainties. And this virus you know, doesn't it doesn't have it seems like a, a path that it's it's taking. It goes one way one day, it goes another way another day. You know, you could say what you want about our, our government and the way that they're handling it, but just strictly talking about it from the lens of you and, and in your leadership position, I would love to get your perspective about you know, how you've gone about trying to tackle these ca- challenges. And and I'm sure you're the type of person just you know talking to you that you're focusing on the things you can control versus the things that you can't control. Um, so I think with that, I, I'd just like to start, you know, when it became obvious. Uh, we don't need to backtrack into into last year. I, I'm more interested in this year and what's happened, or this school year, I, I should say. When, when it became apparent that the virus wasn't going away for the start of the traditional fall semester in August, September, uh, whenever school starts up that way, what were some of the thoughts going through your head as the person leading the school? Like, did you have reservations about you know, sending kids back to school, sending teachers back to school, yourself going back to school. How did you go about like initially trying to navigate through all of that? That's a great question. I want to go quickly back to one of the things you, you just said, because you're saying such such profound things that we have to focus on what we can, tr- can control versus what we cannot control. 
And when we talk about earlier on, you asked how you make time to do so many things. I think oftentimes people focus and they spend a lot of time worrying about the things that they cannot control and maybe finding someone to complain about that with or to perseverate on. I can't control this and and it's really upsetting me. And then all of a sudden you found out you wasted three hours of, of your day worrying about things that were up beyond your ability to change. And if we focus and spend our time working on the things that we can control and that we can fix, that can be uh, a way to make much more productive use of our time. Now, when it comes to the opening of the schools, I have to say that I was just one small cog in a phenomenal machine that started from our superintendent all the way down through the other leaders, the other principals, the other administrators, numbers of teachers who we stayed in communication with throughout the summer. So our school year starts in early September. We, uh, I think our first day was September the 2nd. And throughout the summer, we worked collaboratively. We worked throughout the entire summer. I, I don't think anybody really got a real vacation this summer. I, th- I think for primarily, I know I didn't. We spent all our days, even if we were supposedly on vacation that day, talking, planning, making schedules, listening to the community, listening to the teachers, and coming up with the plan to figure out how we can open the school safely. And, and I, as I was listing all those people, I neglected to mention the secretaries, the maintenance, the custodians, the people who oversee those various departments as well, the nurses, because we really made sure that everybody was on page and working together to come up with a plan so that we could open and open as safely as we possibly could while taking all the information that we had and coming up with the best practices we could think of to have the school open efficiently, on time, and safely for the kids, the teachers, and everyone. So can we, (laughs) you obviously be the judge of this, (laughs) can we break down from that the components that you are most concerned with when it comes to to learning and safety, like when it comes to those things that you can control, like what are what are some of the, when you broke that down and you said like okay, we can't control this virus, um, but we can control maybe it is you know mask wearing and social distancing and uh, deep cleaning, etc. Like what are some of those things that you said okay, this is going to lead to a safer environment for everybody and allow us to uh, have our kids learn in mostly the capacity that they're accustomed to. Correct. That that's a. a, a- Great question. Now, when I answer, I don't want to answer as if these were my ideas. Again, I was part of a I was part of a team, and so I don't ever want to give the the impression that somehow I was the genius or the person to blame if it doesn't work. But but <laughs> we're the middle of October now, so it's it's worked, and we're still in school, and things are are running smoothly. It doesn't mean it's going to continue that way because, as you say, the virus is very unpredictable. But the thought was to make the school the safest place it could be by following all of the best research or suggestions or best practices that have been shared with all of us. So we've focused a lot on mask wearing. For example, everyone in the building has to wear a mask. For some people, teachers, that they feel like that wasn't enough. They, they needed greater protections. So the district invested in face guard shields. If a teacher wanted to have the mask on and then the face guard shield in front of that, there's a daily health screening that every child has to go through at home. His parents fill out a a health survey. And then we have stations around the school. We each, this, this, every principal did his or her own way. I came up with different entrances for every single grade. And we have adults at every entrance and the children have a little ID card. And that ID card has a little scan, uh, barcode, and those barcodes get scanned, which says that the parent completed the health uh, screening, which asks all the questions that are necessary to hopefully assure that the child's coming to school safely. Once they pass uh, or demonstrate that they pass that, there's another teacher there or a teaching assistant who takes their temperature to make sure that they don't have a temperature. Outside the school, there are lines where the children line up. At each entrance, again, by grade level, that are six feet apart. So the children know that they stay on the yellow lines and they can't move forward until the next yellow line in front of them is empty. The teachers were willing to come in a little earlier to let this screening process take place. And then instead of the children hanging out in the hallways, 
before school or outside or on the playground. All those things aren't allowed this year, or at least for now. They come right into the school building and they go into their classroom where the teacher's waiting for them. So, so those are a lot of uh, the, the ideas right off the bat to help assure that we're doing things and following protocols to, to help make sure that the kids and the teachers and, and really every adult who's in the building is safe. In addition, one of the great ideas, and I wish I had thought of this, probably about eight years ago, I went to Japan. I was part of an educator tour and I spent two weeks going to different schools at all different levels in Japan, which was a singular event in my life. One of those wonderful memories and, and earth cha- uh, life-changing moments that was just phenomenal. But one of the things in Japan that, that I loved seeing was that the children took ownership of the school and they do a lot of the cleaning in the building themselves. They, they make the messes, they clean them up. One of the things our school has done is the children, before they leave their classroom for the day, there's actually a cleaning solution that, they, that the teacher sprays on the desk and the children then wipe the desks off to say that I was here, I've cleaned up my area, and then the custodians come in and there's a three-step cleaning process that they go through to make sure that the room is thoroughly cleaned for the next next day. But I love the fact that the kids are cleaning and making the environment clean for the next person. You know, instead of saying to the custodian, well, your job is just to clean up after me, they're saying to the custodian, I'm leaving a, a place as clean as I can for you to come in and do your job. So, so those are some of the things. We've also stressed a lot of hand washing, limit the amount of children that can go to the bathroom at a time and, and things like that. But I, I, I do think we did a great job planning and thinking through a lot of different things to make sure that there were processes in place so that the school ran efficiently and runs efficiently, which gives, you know, the, the desks are, we have half the amount of kids in the classrooms. So the desks are all six feet apart and things like that. So, so that there is this sense that we have thought through everything. And that doesn't mean we've solved every problem. I also have a, a pandemic response team that has a number of parents on it uh, from our home and school association and a number of staff members on it, some district members and some building people. And we talk every week about where we can improve and what we can do differently and how we can make it better. And they bring up questions and concerns. This wasn't taken care of, or we thought about this, or the kids weren't really socially distancing in the hallways to re- to keep us all on the same page and focusing on how we can continually improve to keep the school safe. Yeah, and I think everything you just outlined beautifully illustrates how much influence you, know, you have in your position to say that not just teachers and kids who we've spent a good chunk of today's episode focusing on and probably rightfully so, but also the support staff that you mentioned. And then also people that aren't even on your payroll, like parents who (laughs) need to cooperate in this process in order to keep your school safe. uh, And, and as much of a, (laughs) much of a uh, bubble, I guess, from, from the virus as possible. And uh, for you to, you know, do something like have that pandemic response team where you, where you're bringing in some of the parents, and then I'm sure they're influencing other parents and things like that. And it just really goes to show the scope of influence that somebody in a leadership position actually has to have. And, And not everybody's going to be a leader during a global pandemic like you are. But I think, you know, from everything you've talked about today, we're seeing how important it is Uh, Because, you know, just imagine if you couldn't influence (laughs) those people, if they didn't listen to you, they weren't wearing their masks, they're not social distancing, the parents aren't conducting the health checks, you're not in school right now, right? That is is very true. I think the the thing that we've established, and again, I work in a phenomenal district, so this this is true across the board, across the district. I'm going to say that it's especially true for my school because I I think it is true. And I I do think I have the most wonderful school in the whole world. But we've always had a tremendous positive relationship with the parents because I truly believe and they truly believe, or I truly believe they believe, as am I talking in circles, but, but I truly believe that we're all on the same page and they believe we're all on the same page and the teachers believe we're all on the same page. That doesn't mean we all always agree. But we all agree that we are there for the children. And children are our most precious resource. For every individual parent, their own children are their most precious resource. And it's our job to make the school a productive place, a safe place 
physically and emotionally in every possible way so that the children can thrive so that they can self-actualize. And the parents support us on that. The teachers do a great job creating that environment. And then I'm just there to help support all of them in that to, to make sure that we are working together as a team, the community, the teachers, and, and the kids all together. All right, Paul, I've got a couple of questions here to round out our conversation. The first question is just around communication and specifically communication when you don't have an answer to something. Now, again, I am sure there have been scenarios in your career where you haven't had the answer to something and you've had to go about navigating through that. However, in today's world, it seems to be a little bit more magnified because everybody wants the answers, but nobody really has an answer to things right now. So how do you go about communicating, whether it's with your teachers, support staff, the people on your payroll, or the parents and the kids within your community, everything and the decisions that you make without maybe having all the information? Like what, what if somebody comes and asks you a question and you just simply don't know? Like, how do you go about that in today's environment where you know, they, they might be a little more ticked off if you don't have an answer regarding the virus than they would be if you didn't have an answer about, you know, a study group or something back in the day. <laughs> yeah, good, good point. I think they would be more ticked off if, if they felt I was lying to them. So I think everyone knows I, I teach, I, I, I principle from the heart. I'm, I'm transparent. I think everything that we do, we're as transparent as possible. So I answer people honestly. If I don't have an answer, I tell them I don't have the answer to that. I do tell them that I'm going to look for the answer, that we're going to try to solve the the problem. We're going to come up with a solution, or at least I'm going to tell them the ideas that I have or the ways that some some things aren't fixable and some things aren't doable. But I I always answer people honestly. On that, I, I don't have necessarily an answer. I had a parent call me. This is a quick, real quick example. We have a number of students who are all remote. And we're fortunate that we have a staff of teachers that are teaching those all remote kids. But we then also have the teachers that are teaching the kids who are in the building and they're going on a hybrid schedule, half the kids every other day. And then they do the kids when they're home, there's, there's assignments and there's other uh, special area teachers and things that work with them on the days that they're home. And the parents have the opportunity to switch between these different modules, uh, we, we do tell them that it takes time to process all the things that need to be processed in order to move kids. But we also have told them that we can't necessarily accommodate every request in our school. And we have six elementary schools in our district. And sometimes kids may have to be taught by a teacher in a different building in order to make the class sizes work because you can't just, you know, overload a class or, or have a class running with too few kids. And some parents called me today. They were asking about possibly transitioning one of their children. And they were giving me a lot of different scenarios. Well, what if this or what if that? And my answer to some of those things was, I don't know, because I don't know. Uh, They're like, well, what if the class closes? I said, well, right now the class isn't closed. It may close. And when that happens, we'll we'll deal with that. But again, I think the, the answer to a lot of these things is don't make up an answer. Don't pretend like you know something you don't know. Just be honest and say that I don't know or that I don't have control over and I'll I'll find an answer for you. Yeah, and having that awareness, I think, is a key piece to leadership, right? Like, I'm sure it's not easy to tell parents, for example, that you don't know the answer to something, but I think saying it and then following it up with, well, I am going to do this and that to find the answer for you or to get as much information as I can is better than just simply saying, I don't know, figure it out yourself, or I don't know, I don't care. <laughs> right, right, right. I, I, I would never say, I don't know, I don't care. And, and for like that pandemic team, we meet every Tuesday and they bring things up and what I then do is I then hopefully respond with an email back to uh, the people who are have the concern or the whole team, depending on what's the level of the question and, and uh, or whatever. Some, some of the answers I don't report back to the parents because they might be more school specific. But getting back to the people with an answer to prove to them and to demonstrate to them to, that, that we're on top of these things. You brought up a concern. I'm on that concern and we're going to solve that thing. And, and, and again, I think it's that transparency. I don't know everything. Maybe one of the things that comes with time, again, I've been doing, uh, I've been uh, in education, I think it's my 31st year, is 
I think you get more comfortable being able to say, I don't know things. I think when you first start out, you have to feel like you know everything and you have to feel like, you know, anytime you say you don't know, that's, that's somehow a sign of weakness. I, I don't believe that. Uh, I never believed that. But I think maybe once you've been around a long time, and you have a reputation, I hope, of being pretty good at what you do. People accept that there's certain things you don't know because we all don't know everything. Yeah, absolutely. I, unfortunately, I think it is something that you learn over time. You put some maybe unnecessary pressure on yourself or you think that, uh, you know, if, if you're the principal and I'm the teacher that you do expect me to know everything. And so, uh, you know, you come up with those little white lies and then they spin out of control and everything. But I think just centering yourself a little bit more is ultimately shows more more strength and more ability as a leader than anything else. So. I know we're talking about a difficult topic, and I really appreciate the time that you've taken to share with us some of the things that you've been doing from a leadership perspective. And I want to finish off the conversation trying to put a positive spin on a, a really challenging time. And uh, I haven't been able to come up with a better phrase than, you know, what's the best thing, you know, because I, I feel bad saying what's the best thing when, you know, there's uh, hundreds of thousands of people just in our country who have died. But I know that, you know, from like my business, uh, for example, the pandemic has forced me to change in a lot of ways and to adapt. And even in my personal life, uh, it's forced me to change and adapt. And some of those changes have been good and well, uh, well overdue uh, changes. So uh, if there was one thing that you could point to, um, you know, whether it's in your school or uh, whether it's with your leadership team and your teachers that changed for the better as a result of the pandemic, is there something that stands out? Oh, uh, that's another great question. Um, I think a lot of things stand out. I think what one of the things that that this whole thing has shown is the parents have seen the hard work that the teachers do on a daily basis. As I, as you know, that there are certain kids who are remote now. And so those teachers are teaching live into all of those children's homes. And they're seeing how hard it is to truly teach and, and to engage kids for hours on end, day after day after day, and also get them to learn and to make learning fun. And the parents, I think, have been very impressed with, with the job of the teachers because of the great work they're doing. I've, we've also seen a whole lot of creativity, people coming up with new and different approaches on how to reach kids and talk to kids. Personally, one of the things I did uh, starting last year, and I've continued it this year, is, um, since I don't see every kid and I was feeling distant from them, and especially when everybody was home and we couldn't even go out and, and, and visit or anything like that when we were all in lockdown last spring was I just started filming a morning message to the children instead of me being on the PA saying good morning to the school. And those things have slowly evolved into a daily message that each day I film myself and I send the link every day to the parents and to the teachers. And each day begins with hopefully the children and the, and the teachers all watching my morning message. Uh, some people have said it's Reminds them of watching Mr. Rogers. We have a positive theme. <laughs> we do the flag salute. And, and uh, it's just a way to, for us to come together. And it's for, a way for me to tell the kids that I'm proud of them, to remind them to work hard, to be kind, to remind them that no matter where they are, we're all in this together. And, and I also will say the words very often uh, that we love them and that we care for them and that we're, we're a team together and that we're going to get through this. Yeah, that is so, so cool. And uh, I mean, just again, shows your willingness to go the extra mile. I'm sure it could be much easier and much less time consuming just to, like you said, go on the PA announcer, do your announcements real quick. But you obviously showcase the want and the need to connect further with your kids, with your teachers and all that type of stuff. So I think that's awesome. And uh, really glad that you shared that with us and shared everything that you did today with us, Paul. It's been an awesome conversation. And uh, before I let you go, if there are listeners that would like to follow along your journey, get connected with the blog, check out your book, uh, how can we find you on social media? That's awesome. So, so you can find me on Twitter. I'm not on Facebook. I'm on Twitter at Dr. Paul R. Sem. I also have a blog uh, called, uh, <laughs> I'm, forgetting the, I'm forgetting the address of the blog. Isn't that funny? Hold on. 
I'm in front of my computer right now. It's drpaulsem.com, D-R-P-A-U-L-S-E-M.com. That's the site that really is where I put my motivational thoughts, my ideas. There's a lot of running on there right now because I had Achilles surgery back in January, and I've been documenting my, my comeback from that. But I put on a lot of the stories, my motivational stories. I put a lot of them up. It's where you can find my books and information about my books and things like that. And then, of course, there's also the Yankees blog, which is start spreading the news dot blog. It's a baseball blog. It's not just about the Yankees, but I think it's a great Yankees blog. Primarily, we have content, brand new content every single day, a number of times throughout the day. It's a lot of fun. It's engaging. And uh, yeah, hope you stop by and please follow me. Please uh, get in touch with us. And uh, there's, there's ways to communicate with me uh, through either the blog with email addresses or on Twitter through direct messages and things like that. I'd uh, love to hear from people who have other ideas about leadership, positivity, growth, pushing themselves to be the best they can be because really that's that's what we all should be doing. And, and when we do that, we find our lives to be better and more enriched. And I truly believe that the more we love and the more we give, the more those things come right back to us. And it makes the, the whole world a better place. Absolutely. And I encourage people to give you a follow and to reach out. You've been a great resource since we connected and just enjoyed our conversations, enjoyed today's conversation as well, too. And it's recorded. So now we get to put it out into the world and people can hear us banter back and forth. But uh, Paul, I really appreciate you know you taking the time here today to, again, share all your expertise and advice and talk about a, a really difficult and challenging topic. I, I know um, your time is valuable, and I just want to say thank you for taking the time to share with me and to share with the listening audience. I know they're going to learn a lot from you. Thank you, Colin. This has been a pleasure for me. 100%. Thank you. 